Hi, I'm Alan Merritt, and I wanted to uh, give a presentation that uh, I wanted to appreciate first uh, Dr. Jay Greenspan um, inviting me to talk about the epigenetics of the new bronchopulmonary dysplasia. I think we all recognize the important contribution that BPD continues to be in terms of our post-neonatal mortality. And um, although this is only the 2006 Vaughn database, you can see that BPD at 36 weeks is still affecting 35% uh, of infants between 501 and 1500 grams. And actually, uh, Dr. Greenspan and colleagues looked at a gestational age specific span, uh, rate of BPD, and we know that the tinier the baby, the more likely that baby is to have this chronic pulmonary morbidity. Um, Dr. Barbara Smith uh, looked at the uh, neonatal morbidities in 910 infants less than 28 weeks and in the JAMA in 2009, and as you can see from her data, BPD represented 45 percent of the uh, major neonatal morbidities, uh, followed by brain injury and then retinopathy of prematurity. And as the frequency of these morbidities added, that is, frequently a baby with BPD will likely have brain injury and some of them develop ROP, we can get to very high uh, incidences of uh, poor uh, outcome based upon cumulative morbidity. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting slide. Um, Jonathan Maracas uh, placed his hand next to baby Raman who at that time was thought to be one of the smallest babies in the world to survive, weighing slightly over 280 grams at birth. I don't know how Dar uh, Darwin would have uh, considered our efforts. Uh, I think very few of our babies in the natural state would survive. And certainly Gregor Mendel, uh, the geneticist, or Father Mendel, uh, certainly uh, looked at how patterns of uh, colors in peas or patterns of disease in terms of uh, their genetic attributes uh, uh, represented themselves in generation. The uh, person on the uh, lower panel is uh, Dr. Jertle. Dr. Jertle and his co-workers at Duke found that DNA methylation patterns by altering the diet in pregnant rats with methyl donors such as folic acid results in the silencing of the agouti gene due to DNA methylation resulting in offspring with brown colored fur and a lower tendency for obesity, cancer, and diabetes. Jertle reasoned that DNA methylation and histone modification with methyl transferases encoded by a gene DIM5 that encodes histone lyse 9 methyl transferase results in the turning on and off of genes. Well, what does that have to do with neonatology? Dr. Phil Farrell, who's there lecturing to students at uh, the University of Wisconsin and whose lab I worked in the 1970s at the NIH, uh, was one of the very first to really understand how we could affect fetal development. It was uh, Dr. Farrell, whose labs both in Madison and at the NIH uh, determined how betamethasone or other steroids actually induce some of the uh, maturational components of surfactant. And we all know that maternal use or obstetrical use in mothers of betamethasone has dramatically altered uh, neonatal mortality by uh, inducing lung maturation, both components of the surfactant system as well as probably structural anatomy. Well, you know, the studies of both Jertle, Dr. Farrell, and, and numerous others basically have improved our understanding of epigenetics, for it is this epigenetic regulation that determines the potential of a genomic reason, region to be transcribed. This is best understood in terms of uh, methylation of cytosine, guanine, or CPG dinucleotides uh, uh, in the DNA of mammals. Methyl donors such as folic acid, methionine, and other groups are required to establish and maintain DNA methylation. Methyl groups for DNA methylation react reactions are supplied by demethylating the activated form of methionine into S-adenosyl methionine to form S-adenosyl homocysteine and homocysteine. 
So in humans, this ratio of SMA and SAH ratios in the serum are essentially used as markers for global DNA methylation. Well, what does this have to do with BPD? Because certainly there appears to be some regions in, the, uh, in our genetic sequence regarding lung development that can be altered both by prematurity and perhaps by other factors that characterize uh, aspects of pregnancy, and some are actually behavioral choices even by moms. But let's talk a little bit about BPD. Bill Northway, as everyone understands, in 1967, initially described the radiographic characteristics of the old BPD. And, you know, by 1979, we had pretty much used the radiologic presentation, but also basically had said that infants with persisting supplemental oxygen requirements at 28 days of life probably were going to be destined to have a chronic lung disease. Shannon from Toronto in 1988 basically indicated that, well, if we were at 28 days, that's fine, but really because these babies were being born at a variety of gestational ages, we needed to look at supplemental oxygen requirements at 36 weeks postmenstrual age with characteristic uh, lung changes in the chest radiograph to really define BPD. And then actually it was 2000 and 2000, and then again in 2003, the NIH uh, had a consensus statement that basically talked about oxygen requirements at greater than 28 days. And for babies less than 32 weeks, uh, you looked at uh, how they were going to be doing at 36 weeks. Or if they were greater than 32 weeks, you looked at how they were going to be doing both at 28 days and at 56 days after life. I think importantly, in the NIH definition, there was no consideration of altitude. And then there was an NIH consensus statement again, it should be 2000, not 2003, that really described variable uh, severities of BPD, the mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, with babies with mild BPD, in fact, the new BPD, uh, having uh, uh, slightly greater than room air oxygen requirements, those with moderate BPD having oxygen requirements of less than NFIO2 of 0.3 at 36 weeks or discharge or at 56 days after birth if you were greater than 32 weeks, and then those who had severe disease. Now, the severe disease included babies receiving any form of assisted ventilation, including just CPAP or, in some people's parlance, high-flow nasal cannula uh, oxygen to mimic CPAP. But these de definitions really never accounted for altitude of the NICU, so that units in Denver, Boise, Salt Lake City, and lots of other good places whose altitude is around 5,000 feet, where 25 percent is really equal to 21 percent at sea level, um, probably have higher proportions of bronchopulmonary dysplasia than if they were being compared to uh, Columbia, Boston, or maybe even Philadelphia. So we really have to consider these factors, and they're often not done. Well, what are some of the differences between the old BPD and the new BPD? And really, um, we have all seen uh, very premature babies who initially had no respiratory distress syndrome really were in a honeymoon period, uh, very minimal oxygen requirements, but in the first two weeks or so of after birth, developed uh, chronic changes on the chest radiograph that were variably called in the late 1970s, Mickey Wilson, chronic pulmonary insufficiency of prematurity, or new BBT, and these babies by 28 days were really quite sick, often requiring assisted ventilation. But we do know from the limited, and I might say limited autopsy findings, that babies with the newer form of this chronic lung disease had less interstitial fibrosis and scarring. There was clearly maldevelopment of the lung parenchyma and pulmonary vessels, alveolar simplification, fewer and larger alveoli, and lack of secondary crest formation, which is really what heralds the development of more and more alveoli, and reduced squamous metaplasia in the airway epithelium. Well, what seemed to be the trigger? We know that high and persistent levels of inflammatory cells, neutrophils, and macrophages in the airways, without evidence of any infection, both studies that I did and also done by Christian Speer in Germany 
were very frequently found in babies early on who developed bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Others found that both the inflammatory cells and their adhesion molecules were elevated, and a host of studies looked at one or another pro-inflammatory cytokines and found that they were elevated, and in one study, the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 was reduced. Uh, Dr. Charles Cochran and I described 25 years ago the fact that there was an imbalance between elastase and alpha-1 protease inhibitor, and recently this work was confirmed by workers both in Boston and Dr. Crapo's group at National Jewish in Denver. Some of you may recall that in the 1990s, based on some of our initial findings, Dr. Siskel and others in Toronto um, looked at whether or not infusing babies with alpha-1 antiprotease could actually reduce the incidence of BPD, and they were very close. They had uh, an insufficient number of babies to actually prove or disprove uh, this hypothesis, and there were some issues regarding dosage, duration of treatment, and cost. But nonetheless, there seems to be a true pattern of inflammation in babies developing BPD. The structural changes we talked about, and there's been some argument, is this primarily a, a disease of impaired alveolarization with fewer and larger alveoli, or as uh, uh, Dr. Kinsella and Absent might comment, no, it's really a disorder of impaired vascularization of the lung with dysmorphic growth of blood vessels in the lung periphery, fewer vessels, abnormal distribution, and a reduced number of arteries, as well as in the arteries that are there, there's muscular hypertrophy and structural remodeling that inhibits lung growth to make them more predisposed to pulmonary hypertension. Well, let's talk a little bit about epigenetic mechanisms, and this slide from the NIH points out that a variety of epigenetic mechanisms affect development and can be occur in utero, and indeed, we know that a number of environmental toxins, drugs, other pharmaceuticals, getting old, and uh, also aspects of one's diet can really affect uh, how our gene are actually transcribed. And we already talked a bit about the important contribution of JIRTL, but basically DNA methylation silences genes by methylation of this uh, cytosine of the CPG motifs, and uh, hypermethylation islands are created in gene promoters that lead to gene silencing, and hypomethylation may lead to active transcription. There's also a method of non-coding uh, messenger RNAs that interfere with the transcription and protein translation, and histone modification with methylation, acylation, phosphorylation, and ubiquitization of histone tails also regulate transcription of these genes. These can occur at very specific sites and residues and control whether or not a gene, for example, controlling lung development is inactivated by a whole host of factors that the baby may be, uh, may be exposed to during uh, the in utero existence, and that albeit short one when they're born prematurely. So basically, this figure sort of denotes the mechanisms of epigenetic mechanisms um, that we just talked about. It's uh, very complex, it's very interesting to read about, and it's not really covered very much in our neonatal texts. And, and I think we're going to have to pay much more uh, careful uh, notation to how epigenetics influences uh, a baby's development. Well, twin studies performed by uh, Bandari at Yale uh, from uh, 1976 to 1990, looked at, well, what is, the, what is the occurrence of BPD in twins? And he looked, obviously, at monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And what they found was that after they controlled for a whole host of factors that we had all related to the occurrence of BPD, that BPD status in one twin was highly predictive of BPD in the other twin. And um, these findings were also made by uh, uh, Lavier in uh, Vancouver in 2008 when he talked about the heritability of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And according to their studies in twins in uh, British Columbia, that genetic mechanisms may uh, 
play as much as an 80% role in the actual occurrence of this chronic lung disease. And if we look at studies of the association of BPD status, uh, when we look at all other infants in a study population uh, and we look at twins, uh, there is a highly, it should be odds ratio and p-value should be shifted over a space, I'm sorry, uh, that um, if we look at uh, when twin A has BPD and we look at then twin B, compared to all other infants in a study population, the odds ratio is about 2.9. All other twins, the odds ratio goes up. But when we look at one twin and the other twin in the same twin pairing, we see that that odds ratio goes up very, very high to 12.3. So I think we can say that after controlling for, the, for a variety of risk factors, genetic modeling shows that the variance in uh, uh, the, the variability attributed to genetic and then environmental factors is very, very high. Thus, there are both genetic and epigenetic factors that influence the occurrence of BPD. There's been a whole host of candidate genes for uh, being uh, responsible for BPD. Most of these have been rejected, but many have been found in some subpopulation. Adhesion molecules, specifically L-selectin, was upregulated. Uh, certain polymorphisms of uh, genes uh, the capacity to make antioxidants, inflammatory mediators. Dr. Miko Hallman demonstrated that an allele on SPA uh, called A16A6 increased the incidence of BPD, whereas the allele on SPB6AAGG also increased the incidence of BPD. And currently in California, Dr. Hugh Abronovich at Stanford and his colleagues are examining the blood spots of babies from newborn screen in our very diverse population to look at common genetic sequences using genomic arrays to see if they can find common sequences that appear to be related to the occurrence of BPD. And these studies are probably being done elsewhere. So in terms of an intermediate phenotype, we know that a variety of environmental factors and things that we can, you know, that we attribute to things that we do and perhaps things that moms do, do interact to result in BPD, such things as a ventilator trauma, we can talk about that, hyperoxia, um, inflammatory responses with specific cytokines like IL-6, maternal, nutri maternal nutritional status, maternal glucocorticoid exposure, Import, importantly, maternal tobacco exposure and chorioamnionitis. And then the genetic susceptibility that we just spoke about. All these things are interacting in a given gestation, in a given baby, to enhance or reduce that baby's risk. Well, some of these risks, in fact, are modifiable. For example, we know that maternal tobacco smoking during pregnancy causes fetal growth restriction. We have heard uh, much about chorioamnionitis and its potential contributory role, both from an inflammatory perspective as well as the fetal inflammatory response in causing BPD. Uh, neonatologists for years have argued over what form of ventilation is better. Um, and, you know, whole industries have developed about providing a sort of ventilator that would reduce the baby's incidence of BPD. I'm not particularly convinced that we have data that support one mode or another. We're all obviously concerned about hyperoxia. An interesting vitamin D and vitamin A status, retinoic acid sufficiency during pregnancy may well uh, permit uh, epigenetic factors to regulate gene expression. So there's many genetic and epigenetic factors that influence BPD development. The whole notion of the Barker hypothesis that events during fetal life affect adult diseases may also be the Bar Barker hypothesis that events in utero certainly affect newborn diseases in terms of their chronic chronicity, like bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Let me talk a little bit about maternal smoking. We know that tobacco smoke causes DNA damage, and um, clearly maternal smoking uh, contributes to fetal growth restriction. 
We know that simply infusing nicotine into fetal rhesus monkeys soon after conception and uh, throughout pregnancy leads to alveolar simplification and a 16% decrease in lung weight, and it upregulates collagen expression. Tobacco smoke constituents need to be metabolized and detoxified to uh, minimize the oxidative stress and the toxic effects on both the mother and the fetus. So a combination of genetic and environmental factors may determine whether or not that fetus of a smoking mother uh, gets BPD or not. And we also know that maternal tobacco smoking influences the fetal uh, antioxidant responses. And BPD is associated with maternal tobacco smoking. In fact, two studies, one that I performed and another in Germany found, it's between a two and a three-fold risk of BPD when you took into a variety of other factors uh, but independently assessed for maternal smoking. And then there's, we know, a strong association between maternal smoking and not only BPD but other childhood diseases such as reactive airways disease, chronic upper respiratory and lower respiratory infections, and asthma, as well as apnea. So we know that cigarette smoke can influence um, how the, uh, there is mRNA expression, both in animal models and possibly in humans. And if we look at the um, histology, and in this case, uh, of rats exposed to tobacco smoke for simply four hours a day during the last trimester or the last several days of their gestation, we see alveolar simplification that's very similar to that described by Dr. Colson. And if we look at those same uh, rats and we look at a little lower power and we uh, just expose those rats, mothers, and thereby the fetuses to tobacco smoke. We see alveolar simplification that's very similar to what we see in some babies with BPD. So uh, that's something that we as neonatologists and our, certainly our obstetric colleagues can influence. So there is a global reduction in DNA methylation among infants exposed to intrauterine tobacco smoke. Um, and um, I believe that this is an area that we need to spend a lot more uh, time and effort in trying to reduce that exposure. In Poland, uh, Dr. Florek, myself, and Dr. Jan Mazella looked at the um, uh, nitrosolamines in mothers who were non-smokers exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke. They call it environmental tobacco smoke. And among smokers, and in the upward going triangles are the moms, the downward triangles are the babies, and you can see in the non-smokers are obviously uh, none of these nitrosolamines. They're slightly elevated in the uh, babies whose moms were exposed to secondhand smoke, usually that of the, their spouse. But in smokers, it's elevated, definitely, and in fact, it's higher in the fetus than in the mother. I, I won't go into the fact that we all know about the bad effects of smoking on maternal health. Well, one of the major antecedents of uh, chronic lung disease was uh, explained this year, and uh, Dr. Lawton and Dr. Bowes in North Carolina showed that among infants with little exposure to oxygen during the first two weeks, fetal growth restriction is a factor very strongly associated with the development of BPD. We've already talked about some factors that cause fetal growth restriction. And among infants with pulmonary deterioration or early and persistent pulmonary dysfunction, even when you control for gestational age, male gender, mechanical ventilation, fetal growth restriction is a major contributor to BPD. Thus, BPD can occur in babies exposed to little supplemental oxygen. So this must be really a fetal phenomena as opposed to a post-birth phenomena. And of course, in California, we're really trying to get moms to stop smoking. But I would also submit to you that we as neonatologists can do a whole lot better job. And uh, in our NICU, you don't escape unless if you're a smoker, unless you get enrolled into a smoking succession program. How about chorioamnionitis and bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Dr. Rose Viscardi at Maryland has really uh, focused in on this uh, issue for much of her uh, career. I knew her as a resident uh, 
and uh, she's really a very uh, wonderful human being. But what she did was to demonstrate very convincingly that moderate, especially moderate to severe BPD, was almost always associated with some degree of uh, moderate to severe or mild chorioamnionitis, and much more moderate to severe. I think we have all been able to determine which of these two placentas has chorioamnionitis. Um, and um, we need, of course, to look at these placentas because obviously if we wait for the pathology report to come back, it may be weeks. Um, but uh, knowing right off that a baby has been exposed to chorioamnionitis not only may influence our uh, selection of antibiotics, but certainly we might understand that that baby is at a much greater risk for eventually developing uh, BPD or the new BPD. Primarily, we know that this is an ascending affection, and we all know about the relative importance of prolonged rupture of membranes. We know that one twin, especially the presenting twin, can be uh, exposed. Uh, however, there is hematogenous forms uh, of uh, exposure to both fetuses. And of course, Al Alan Job in Cincinnati and a number of others have demonstrated that whatever can cause the fetal inflammatory response, including simply the injection of endotoxin into the amniotic fluid, can, on the one hand, enhance fetal lung development, but on the other hand, create chronic inflammation that results in a form of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, primarily in their fetal lamb model. While there is some conflict in the literature regarding the impact of chorioamnionitis on BPD, um, there's a variety of issues regarding the timing, differing organisms, which I'll talk about, the fetal inflammatory response, whether it has to be chorioamnionitis, deciduitis, and fundicitis, and whether or not their clinical correlations between chorioamnionitis, RDS, and BPD are confounded by other factors still remain to be, I think, really specifically figured out. Nonetheless, uh, we all know that chorioamnionitis uh, can be very harmful to the newborn, and in an infected lung, there is probably a much greater risk for ventilator-induced trauma. We as neonatologists don't usually look at the uh, histopathologic findings of the chorion and amnion. Maybe we should. Uh, I was fortunate to be mentored by Dr. Kurt Benershka, and we got to examine every placenta of every baby born at the University of California, San Diego, and certainly any baby admitted to the NICU. And various organisms cause various degrees of chorioamnionitis. And it's very interesting that if you look at a non-infected uh, chorion and amnion, you see virtually no inflammatory response. If there's mycoplasma hominis, you see a differing pattern than if there is ure urea plasma parvium, in which there is a tremendous infection uh, that is an uh, uh, inflammatory response in the infant's chorion. And we've seen these chest radiographs, a uh, baby with very mild RDS who then gets this reticulated interstitial pattern over the first week, although he may have started out in virtually no oxygen, who by almost the second week now has really full-blown uh, radiographic patterns characteristic of BPD. We culture these infants and we frequently culture them for urea plasma and we find a positive and we make an association that there may in fact be causation. Well, I'm sorry, that's, that's been a real uh, issue of contention. So we have issues about cr chronic versus acute chorioamnionitis, some which is symptomatic, some which is indolent. There may be single or multiple organisms. Some of these organisms, people would argue, may be commensal. It's interesting that um, uh, in Alabama, some 25 percent of the cord blood and in also culturing of the placenta uh, among that population in Alabama had urea plasma. I don't know what your population uh, in terms of urea plasma colonization or infection is. I certainly know that in Poznan, Poland, it's running around 23 to 25 percent. Unfortunately for us, uh, we don't get our results back in any sort of a relevant time frame to make decisions. And so if we see this pattern, we frequently start babies on treatment, whether or not 
that's justified as a, a matter of some controversy. We'll talk about that. One of the other interesting things is that if you give a baby who has initial respiratory distress syndrome and you give them surfactant, and, and in the upper panel it's the first dose, you, you see that if they have uh, no evidence of histologic chorioamnionitis, they see that very predictive response of weaning the FiO2 rapidly. These babies sort of sail through the RDS period and do well without requiring a lot of supplemental oxygen. If on the other hand, as is in the upper one with all the asterisks, you have histologic chorioamnionitis and fundicitis, you may see that initial response to surfactant and then they relapse, and they relapse very quickly. And you wonder, well, did I not give enough? Did I give it into the wrong, you know, I only got it into one lung? The chest radiograph doesn't really improve much. Well, I can tell you that surfactant is not a very good treatment for neonatal pneumonia. Uh, and if you have chorioamnionitis, fundicitis, and you have neonatal pneumonia, you may get a transient response to surfactant. Um, and in fact, in the lower panel, you'll see that the response even to the second dose is muted among those who have been exposed to chorioamnionitis. So clearly, babies who have chorioamnionitis, uh, when it's evaluated for and you follow the respiratory course, is a much more complicated course. And is the complicated course itself, or is it the inflammation of the lung, that results in a more complicated course because we have to ventilate them differently, give them more oxygen that results in their chronic lung disease. That, that really needs to be sorted out. So this goes over the Alabama study that I basically talked about, but, but nonetheless, in, in, those, in those women who had urea plasma, mycoplasma, um, although the incidence of RDS was very similar, the incidence of BPD was nearly threefold greater in those moms who uh, not only had histologic choreo, fundicitis, but look at the incidence of BPD very significant. So we know that ventilation and postnatal sepsis increases BPD in, in preterm infants exposed to chorioamnionitis. Problem is, trying to treat it has been a real difficult problem. Now, um, in the study that I mentioned by Lawton, the, among 1,205 extremely low gestational age newborns uh, with systematic placental pathology, Basically, they found that uh, intrauterine infection by itself was a major risk factor, but those who had atypical chronic lung disease, they frequently found uh, a relationship. They did not exclude the possibility that intrauterine inflammation followed by postnatal ventilator-induced lung injury may be the strong interaction that results in chronic lung disease. I, I interpret this important study as saying that if the lung is inflamed for whatever reason and we ventilate it, we're going to be doing a lot more damage than if we take a lung that isn't inflamed, even though it's very immature, and damage it. Well, um, the role of urea plasma has been debated. Uh, a number of schemas have been shown to explain how this relationship may occur. S there's been some conflict in the literature, and there may have been some publication biases, but clearly there appears to be a strong relationship, even though uh, that at this point has been denied. Now there was a very nice study done in Kentucky that showed that if, and also uh, uh, one done in Japan that showed that if you uh, treated babies right from the get-go with azithromycin, versus control, that there was a relative risk uh, reduction. Um, and it's surprising to me that although there have been many uh, applications to the NIH about randomized controlled trials treating infants with azithromycin, and the pharmacokinetics has been very well worked out in babies of 24 to 28 weeks, no such large randomized controlled study has been done. So we're still in the darkness about whether or not a proportion of babies who in fact have intrauterine infection, maybe with urea plasma, can be effectively treated. And certainly the usual antibiotics that we use are not helpful. Well, how about some other factors? 
vitamin D. We know that vitamin D is very critical for lung development, and Rayanne and Torday at uh, UCLA Torrance have reported that vitamin D deficiency in the mothers interferes with lung development because vitamin D interacts with both the mesenchyme and the ectoderm epithelial differenti differentiation. And vitamin D deficient rat dams have pups with fewer alveoli, less developed small distal airways, and upregulated bronchial smooth muscle. Now, although we would like to make sure that all mothers get prenatal vitamins, I don't know how many mothers you're seeing with limited or no prenatal care, or moms who've just decided not to follow what her obstetrician recommends. But, you know, uh, getting the vitamins, uh, especially vitamin D and, uh, of course, vitamin A, which I'll talk about later, is very important. And there's lots of evidence that in a variety of animal models that uh, vitamin D is critical for lung development and, in fact, in gene regulation. Vitamin A. Um, it's really disturbing to me that among African-American women, at least in 2004 in the United States, were reported to be vitamin D deficient and vitamin A deficient, too. So I think internists are now, and some obstetricians are measuring vitamin A and vitamin D levels, mostly vitamin D levels, and trying to uh, supplement moms with these vitamins. Well, retinoic acid has been uh, known to affect lung development since the early 1980s. We also know that retinol in mothers whose infants developed BPD were lower, and Chennai down at Vanderbilt reported a reduction, albeit a small one, um, in uh, BPD uh, with vitamin A supplementation. And the NICHD conducted a large trial, and as you know, uh, as Dr. Tyson published, there was about a 5% reduction in BPD with vitamin A supplementation for four weeks after delivery in a large randomized trial. Uh, we know that vitamin A usage across this country varies somewhat, uh, with a number needed to treat of 20 to get one benefit, and s as well as the occasional uh, uh, non-availability of injectable vitamin A. Some units have abandoned its use. We still use it. The old and new BPD have been associated with prolonged ventilation, the old pressure, versus, uh, pressure times time times the amount of oxygen. Um, my bias is that there's no substantial evidence that either high-frequency oscillatory ventilation or high-frequency jet ventilation has actually altered the occurrence of BPD. The one study from Provo, Utah, really has never been duplicated, and we all know about the NIH hummingbird study. Um, but the important thing is that we need to use our ventilators, whichever one we decide, very skillfully. We know that in utero ventilation, in utero ventilation, that is uh, just inflating the lung in utero, which has been done by the Australians, will impair alveolar ventilation, uh, alveolarization. That is, something that causes premature stretch of the lung leads to incomplete lung development. And I'll go a little bit for, uh, in the lecture to talk about the impact of INO. But essentially, the other major hypothesis is that there's inadequate vascularization. And we know that distal vasculogenesis uh, and distal angiogenesis in three different models have been associated with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And if you look at uh, animals who have been exposed to factors such as very severe ventilation or very high oxygen exposure uh, with or without nitric oxide have impaired vasculogenesis. Well, Cohen at Harvard analyzed cord blood RNA found, and they found that histone acyltransferase binding activity and chromatin remodeling pathways and pathways regulating cell growth were differentially expressed actually right in the cord blood in babies going on to develop new BPD. And we now know that nasal ventilation, uh, nasal CPAP or nasal high frequency ventilation, but not conventionalization, but not conventional ventilation, actually preserves the histone acylation pathways. Kurt Albertine and Dr. Rahan have published very recently studies showing that you can preserve lung function and preserve histone acylation pathways by 
gentle, non-invasive ventilation, including high frequency using the nasal mode. And that there may be some drugs, such as valproic acid and triclostatin A, that can protect the lung uh, development. Parathyroid hormone-related protein is a highly conserved and stretch-regulated protein. And in knockout mice for this uh, protein, they fail to develop alveoli. You know, it's expressed in the endoderm and binds to the mesoderm to upregulate the local inflammatory response and acts to integrate surfactant synthesis and alveolar capillary perfusion. It's really a very critical protein. So uh, the nuclear transcription factor, uh, PPAR gamma, promotes lung development, and the use of agonists, such as rosaglitolone may reduce the, the stretch-induced lung injury. We don't know whether it in reduces the stretch and inflammatory induced lung injury. And um, there is a paper in press uh, in pediatric research showing that high-frequency nasal ventilation in fetal lambs preserves lung architecture. That is, they do not have the alveolar simplification. Well, what does this mean to us clinically? We all know about the three big trials that have been reported, the COIN trial, the support trial, and the bond trial. And we look at BPD versus those who received intubation and those using CPAP. I think it's fair to comment that the types of CPAP were not always consistent. But if we really look at the differences between BPD, and this is the new BBT in both babies ventilated with intubation, surfactant, versus those receiving CPAP, that the absolute difference is really rather small. And there was a recent meta-analysis in the July pediatrics showing that it really only equals 0.5. So there is a tremendous amount of interest in whether or not we can reduce CPAP by, reduce BPD by the use of CPAP. I think that at this point, at least with variable forms of CPAP as used, um, there's no compelling evidence. Now, I know that uh, our folks at Columbia would probably disagree with this statement. They've been very, very successful. And there was a recent publication showing that use of bubble CPAP, essentially in the delivery room and thereafter, is protective. But at least from the randomized trials, uh, there's no evidence that CPAP used, as it is in a variety of institutions in this country, has actually compellingly reduced the occurrence of this disease. I want to skip over this. Oxygen toxicity. We know that oxygen can be toxic and uh, for a variety of reasons, reactive oxidant species uh, can uh, adversely affect development. And we know that babies born prematurely have inadequate antioxidant responses. We know that there is uh, changes in alveoli by increased oxygen tension and there is a f some effects on gene transcription um, and uh, that uh, some of our pathways can be altered uh, for antioxidant formation in the presence of high amounts of supplemental oxygen. And we know that babies have low plasma antioxidant activities. So pulmonary oxygen toxi toxicity through the generation of oxygen and nitrogen species in excess of antioxidant defenses is believed still to be a major contributor to BPD. And we note that, of course, the more immature we are, the more subject to free radical mediated pulmonary protein oxidation uh, the babies are, and they also have the least amount of antioxidants. The uh, finer support trial, as you know, uh, did not really find that BPD was that significantly reduced. Vento, however, in Spain, has found using lower SAO2 targets that BPD was reduced. But we also know that while ROP and to a degree uh, BPD were somewhat lessened in the support trial in the lower group, there was all, also an increased mortality uh, so that the number needed to treat was eight for benefit, at least for ROP, the number needed to harm and by harm, I mean death, was 1 in 20. Uh, so now there's uh, been substantial concerns raised as to what is our correct oxygen targeting. And the BOOST-2 trial in Australia also found increased mortality among infants targeted to the lower range. 
So uh, in a very recent issue of uh, Neonatology, uh, Salkstad, Holiday, and Speer strongly recommend that we avoid the lower oxygen targets, but I think this will still remain an area of controversy. Um, a little bit about INO, surfactant, and BPD. As you know, uh, Roberta and Phil Ballard, and uh, Phil Ballard specifically looked at the surfactant. They found that, that they could, in a very small, limited weight group, reduce the babies having bronchopulmonary dysplasia by their uh, treatment with uh, INO beginning at seven to 10 days for another three weeks. They then expanded that study to look at the use of cefactin or InfoSurf plus INO. And now newer studies are underway to see if they gave more frequent surfactant because it must be SPB turnover plus the effects of INO on pulmonary vascular resistance that contribute to uh, whether or not we have further lung vascular development. And these studies harken back to the initial report by Bose that Perhaps these babies have ongoing surfactant deficiency and that we need to be giving them boosts of surfactant to reduce their overall occurrence of BPD. Well, I do have a, a large sort of summary slide, but it, I think it's uh, not very uh, visible in this uh, conference room. And I just wanted to sort of conclude by saying that we have to take this disorder very seriously both its genetic component and its epigenetic component. You know, there's long-term complications and we all have followed these babies for years. Many are prone to pulmonary and systemic hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, early onset pulmonary hypertension, bone and mineral metabolism probably related to the way that we treat this disorder, feeding, aversion, GE reflux, clearly well-documented neurodevelopmental delay and a fourfold increase in cerebral palsy. We know that many of these babies will remain in, this, in the uh, in ICUs for days, weeks, on occasion months longer than their peers who do not have this chronic lung disease. So this has important cost implications, important implications for the family and important implications for that baby in terms of being able to be with its family and have a, a meaningful infancy. Well, I also want to make a pitch for the fellows to focus in on some of the epigenetic factors because there's, some je there's drugs that moms use, like tobacco, that can alter fetal lung development, yet we're not doing enough in this area to try to get moms to uh, stop poisoning themselves in their fetus. Nutritional deficiencies, our obstetric colleagues, you know, give them prenatal vitamins, but are we really giving them diets that are rich in fruits, vegetables, other antioxidants uh, that will uh, hopefully promote a healthy pregnancy and healthy weight gain by that fetus? Can we reduce lung inflammation and by use of better or more selective antibiotics? Intrauterine growth restriction has been shown to be a very common precursor of BPD. We don't always know why that fetus is growth restricted. Some of those babies need out of the womb sooner than later, but clearly intrauterine growth restriction is, a, is not a, a great for lung development. And then there are a variety of genetic diseases. But this, if you will, Barker hypothesis affecting fetal and neonatal diseases have impact throughout the rest of that child's life as an infant, a child, an adolescent and a young adult. And this slide by Dr. Hay points out that we really need to make things right at the very beginning because these kids are going to have lifelong problems that relate to chronic disabilities. And we know among BPD, of course, limited pulmonary reserve, asthma, and uh, certain cognitive and behavioral disorders. So I want to thank you for uh, hearing my rendition of what I think we need to know about the new BPD. I'd be very interested in answering any questions that you might have. Thanks.